I recently got my hands on this black walnut slab, and as you'll see, it's one of the nicest pieces of lumber I've been lucky enough to work with. I'll be building a desk with this slab using a design that I've wanted to try for a while, and originally this desk was going to be for me, but in the end I decided to sell it, but I'll explain more about why here in a bit. You may also notice that I'm building this in my new shop that I just moved into, and this created a whole host of issues throughout this build. Walnut isn't near as abundant around Texas and Oklahoma as it is up in, say, the Pacific Northwest, but every now and then you can find some really stunning pieces, and this was definitely one of those. This slab is a crotch slab, meaning this is where the trunk first branched off into two. All that weight and compression on this section of the trunk creates this swirling figure, and I've never worked with a slab with such a long section of crotch figure. The crotch is seven foot long, which in and of itself is impressive. And no, I'm not trying to make any innuendo here. I just really like working with such nice wood. So at this point, I had been in the new space for about two weeks, but we were still waiting on all the electrical to be run. And I couldn't even run my CNC to flatten the slab yet. Luckily, my friend Todd Miller, who's the owner of Vintage Reclaim Lumber, let me use his wood whiz slab flattener and Vintage Reclaim Lumber is also where we found this gem. This slab was buried under a pile of slabs on the back of the property and sort of forgotten. But when I dug through the pile and I saw this, I knew that I had something really nice. This slab has been air drying for a couple years, and I've heard that air dried walnut has better color than kiln dried walnut. I have no idea if that's actually true, but as you'll see, this walnut was really, really beautiful and a lot different than the other black walnut slabs that I've worked with that come from my area. Also, don't worry, they've got a whole stack of these, so if you want one, you can pick one up for yourself. And if you tell Vintage Reclaim Lumber that Johnny Build sent you, they'll even give you a discount. Okay, so that wood whiz is basically somewhere in between a CNC machine and a giant router sled. It has a five inch cutter head on it. And after a few hours, I was able to get both sides of this piece flat and head back to the shop. So the focal point on this piece is the crotch figure, and I want to make sure I position the figure so it runs parallel across the width of the desk. This way the crotch is going to be right up front in the center. Again, I'm not making some sort of juvenile innuendo. This figure is actually called crotch figure or compression figure, and my goal here is to educate and inform not make subtle anatomical jokes. Often on my builds, the epoxy is one of the main features, but I wanted that to be more utilitarian on this project. I have to fill this void, but I took one of the offcuts from trimming the slab down and I'll flip that around to fill this space up. I can cut this quickly over my bandsaw, but as I was cutting, the bandsaw just kind of sounded a bit off. Thankfully, I was wearing my brown pants that day. Hello, darkness. And I can finish that cut with the track saw. I probably should have just done that in the first place. One of my favorite parts of working with walnut, besides how good it looks, is how easy it is to clean up the live edges. The bark peels off fairly easy, and a sander cleans up the rest really fast. With the crotch all clean, I can set it for the epoxy pores, and I'm trying a different way of building a form. I'm using the same stucco tape on the bottom of the form that I always use, and then I'm running a bead of latex caulk all the way around the base of the slab to prevent epoxy from seeping under. This should both save on the amount of epoxy that I need and make the cleanup much simpler. Right here, you can see where I want the epoxy to flow into that larger crack on the left side of your screen, so I'm adding caulking around this part. Normally, I would place the edges on the form and then add caulk where it joins the base, but this time I added caulk to the bottom of the edges of the form, and this worked out really well. As you can see, I was very liberal with the amount of caulk I used, and with all this caulk talk, I made zero caulk jokes, and honestly, I'm just proud of myself and the amount of personal growth that I've experienced. For those pours, I'm using Total Boat Thick Set Fathom, which you can pour up to two inches deep at a time, versus regular Thick Set, which is only one inch deep at a time. Even though I could pour this whole thing in one go, since the slab is right at two inches thick, I was cautious and only poured an inch deep that first day. Total Boat is a longtime sponsor, and I've got a link below where you can get a discount if you want to pick up some epoxy or some finish. A day later, the epoxy still hadn't hardened, but it was reading about 60 degrees, so I went ahead and added the final one inch deep pour and headed out of town for a maker meeting. I let that cure for three days and that epoxy had hardened up nicely where I can take it out of the form. I did not tape to the sides of the form like I normally do, but except for this one edge, the sides came off fairly clean.
So the main feature of this desk is gonna be a monitor stand that doubles as a cabinet to place my computer and other items while working at the desk. The door of this cabinet will be a timbre door, which is a sliding door made from strips of wood. And I decided to use some leftover purple heart because it looks really nice as a contrasting wood to wall. To make the tambour, I realized I was missing some needed supplies. So I made a trip to a local woodworking store that had just opened up in my city. Rockler just opened a store here in my hometown of Oklahoma City. We're gonna go check it out and do some shopping. Let's go. This is a uh, small part sled, which is gonna be perfect for those tambour doors that I'm making. This is what I'm talking about right here. It's got all the different kinds of gluing accoutrement that you might need. I actually already have one of these. The funny part is I got it for my old table saw and it's never fit my current table saw. I need a new Rockler mug too. Mine uh, broke in the move. You guys know Rockler is a longtime sponsor of this channel and I'm super excited there's a Rockler store in my city now. Make sure to check it out if you're in the area. It's got everything you could possibly need for all your woodworking projects. Thank you, Miami. Thank you. You have a good day. I'm cutting strips of this six inch wide purple heart board into half inch pieces. And I wanna talk real quick about some inspiration that I got the weekend before when I made a trip up to Philadelphia for a maker meetup. I met this really talented woodworker named Larissa Huff. And while I was touring her shop, I saw a cabinet that she had just finished and it had a continuous grain timbre door on it. I've done a set of timbre doors in the past when I built that record cabinet, but they weren't continuous grain. So I really got inspired to do that on this piece. This purple heart has a nice grain pattern. So as I cut the strips, I have to number them to keep them in order. And I ended up with 55 strips for the size of door I needed. Now I can finally take that slab over to my CNC to flatten it since I finally have it running. And behind the scenes, I had all sorts of trouble getting it to that point. You see, in my shop, I do have access to three-phase power, which the spindle needs to run at full power to run at that full 8.7 horsepower. But when I tried to use it, I discovered there's two different types of three-phase power. There's three-phase Y and three-phase Delta. Now, I couldn't begin to tell you what that means because, well, the only college I went to was the U of SMC. But what I do know is I have three-phase Delta delta and this machine requires three phase Y. I could have went out and bought a $3,000 converter, but instead I've just got it running on single phase 240. And this means I get six horsepower out of my spindle versus the 8.7 horses like in my old shop. But as you can see, that six horsepower is more than enough to plow right through the slab and get it flat. Again, notice that I made no plowing jokes, no jokes about how my wife says six horsepower is actually average. Like I'm doing pretty good here, even though I wanted to. I'm doing pretty good here. Also, I left out the part where once I got power figured out, I learned that my spindle had been damaged in the move and no longer worked. So then I had to wait another week to get in a working spindle to replace the old one. And now I can finally run my CNC again. It's such a huge part of my workflow, but this really made me wonder, am I too reliant on my CNC? I'm curious what y'all think. Do I use it too much? I do have some ideas for some builds where I'd limit myself from using some of my larger tools. If that's something you'd like to see, just drop a comment down below and let me know. Now, it's unlikely to have any effect on my decision-making process, but I truly am curious what you guys think. Also, if you're hearing that really loud noise in the background, it's the electricians pulling wire in the ceiling directly above me. And this was going on constantly throughout this build, which made filming this project very difficult at times, but I'm not complaining here. I'm very thankful they were able to get all my electrical and lights wired up. Now, if I could just get my air conditioner to work and get Wi-Fi, life would be perfect. I'm trying something a little different for that edge profile. Normally I like a big old round over on the bottom, but on this piece, I thought a sharp chamfer would look really nice. So I went out, I picked up this 60 degree chamfer bit online. This thing set me back 120 bucks. I'm really happy with how that steep chamfer looks combined with a slight round over on the top. It definitely gives it more of a mid-century vibe. With having to change out the CNC spindle, I had to retram the machine. And if you don't know what tramming is, it's just getting the bit perfectly 90 degrees to the wasteboard. You can see here those deep grooves on the top showing that I wasn't even close to getting it trammed, but I didn't have time to mess with it anymore. And as a result, I had a ton of sanding to do. So I saved the lower end of the slab that I cut off earlier to build the tambour, monitor, riser, cabinet thing. And after milling up the wood, I put that on the CNC to carve the top. So when I was carving this on the CNC and I, I took it off the wasteboard, I was bummed because this big piece chipped out. But then I looked at the other side and realized that somehow this interior uh, track for the timbre doors had somehow gotten off 
of alignments. It sucks because this was an actual piece of that slab that I used to carve that out of. That wood is just so pretty. I've got some walnut here to replace it. It's nowhere near as nice as the original walnut from the slab. I guess I just wasn't paying good enough attention. After gluing up a new panel for the top, I can start carving the curved ends for the tambour cabinet. And this is a technique you've seen me use a bunch of times here in the past year or so. And because I've done it so many times, I've learned some tricks along the way. So I've done enough of these segmented glue ups like this to know that I always get tear out on one end and this time was no exception, but I actually added some extra length to the pieces right here. I made this little jig right here. This piece can slot down in here. I will run that through the table saw, cut these ends off and I don't have to worry about the tear out. So as I glue these up, I just wanna stop and say thanks for all your support. It feels wild that just a couple years ago I was working out of my little bitty garage and now I'm in this huge shop with all this exciting equipment and more on the way. And I have all of you and your support to thank for that. I was able to retire from that full-time day job six months ago and now I do this full-time. Now there's a lot of days where we're building these projects and making mistakes and making the videos and just kind of everything that goes along with that can be really stressful. But I still think my worst day in the shop is better than my best day at my old job. So if you're not subscribed and you enjoy these videos, please hit that subscribe button and follow along as I make more projects in the upcoming videos. Seriously, I can't thank you enough, but I'd like to do something nice for y'all. Somewhere in the remainder of this video, I've hidden a little Easter egg. If you're the first one to spot it, leave a comment, tell me what it is and the timestamp of where you saw it, and I'll send you a Johnny Builds t-shirt for free no matter where you are in the world. This slab had several bark inclusions and cracks that needed cleaning up, including this large crack on the end. Now, I'm gonna secure this with bow tie inlays versus filling it with epoxy. I'm also gonna do something several of you viewers mentioned on past projects about fixing cracks on the bottom of a piece with bow ties. Normally, I don't focus on the underside as much as the top, but on this piece, I wanted to level up my woodworking a little bit, so the bottom has two fairly big cracks, and I'm adding bow ties to both. No one's ever gonna see these, but I'm gonna be happy just knowing that they're there. To do these bow ties, I'm using a bow tie template that I bought online. It's from a company called Slab Stitcher. This isn't sponsored, I bought it with my own money, but they do make really nice templates. And my favorite part is they sell the bow ties to match. I do have to come back with a chisel and square up the corners where the router bit couldn't reach because, well, the router bit is round. But these bow ties came out really nice. This knot filler is another tool I purchased that I really liked, and there's several different brands that all seem to work the same, but I'll link the one that I use down below. Now, the polymer that I use to fill these cracks seems like it wouldn't be durable, but in my experience, it works pretty well. I mean, this is the same stuff that they use to fill knot holes on hardwood flooring, so I think if it's strong enough for something that you walk on, then it's good enough for this desk. On the top of the desk, I did bow tie inlays in that larger crack you saw me cleaning up a minute ago. And I went with a descending size pattern, which I think looks really good. I always think bow tie inlays look aesthetically pleasing and my eye is always drawn to them whenever I see a piece with bow ties out in the wild. So I'm always a little surprised when I do bow tie inlays and I get comments telling me how ugly they are. So I wanna conduct a poll in the comment section, which this should be very scientific and provide a definitive answer to the age old question of bow ties, good or no good. So if you like bow ties, just type in bow ties with a thumbs up emoji. And if you don't like bow ties, then type bow ties with a thumbs down emoji and help me get to the bottom of the great bow tie debate. All right, moving on, I recut the panel for the top of the tambour monitor riser cabinet, and thankfully I got it right this time. Now these inside edges are pretty tight, so to allow the tambour door to slide more freely, I chiseled out that sharp corner on the top piece and on the groove cut into the slab. 
Like I mentioned earlier, when I went shopping, this Rockler small part sled is perfect for making the rabbits on the ends of the tambour strips. I've got this stop block position so that each strip is about an eighth inch shorter than the height of the door opening. You want the tambour to have a little bit of wiggle room because if it's too tight, it's definitely gonna bind up in you and not work. And this took about an hour to cut both sides of 55 strips of tambour. As I sand each piece, you'll see that I created a jig for the tambour assembly. And this jig is important to secure all the pieces tightly and keep everything aligned for the next step, which is gluing on a piece of canvas that's gonna hold the tambour together. This is just a cheap painting drop cloth canvas. It's actually left over from the first time I did tambour doors. And the wood glue bonds really well to the canvas and to the wood. What I do have to be careful of is that any wood glue that happens to squeeze down in between the strips. After 45 minutes of letting it set up, I took the tambour out of the jig and made sure none of those pieces were sticking together. And I'm really digging that continuous grain look and it's actually kind of fun to play with. It's almost like a big wooden fidget toy. This here is the last remaining piece of that original slab, and I'm using this to create a little shelf inside the tambour cap. This shelf will hold the computer, and below it will give me space to slide in a keyboard and a trackpad when I'm not using it. The back end of the shelf has two slots to allow pass-through of cables without interfering with the tambour door as it slides around the back. After a bit of resizing the legs and adding a round over, I can glue up that shelf. Back to the tambour door, I need a door pull and it has to be wide enough that it catches on the ends of the cabinet. So I just used a random spray can that I had laying in the shop to lay out a half circle and cut that with my jigsaw. Now I did cut it pretty rough so I can then sand it back to the line that I drew. And now I need to add a relief for the finger pull. I had no idea initially how I was gonna do this, but I remembered I had this little cordless detailed sander that was the perfect size for this. And with some 80 grit sandpaper, this worked surprisingly well to make that finger relief. After a lot of sanding, I glued this onto the first strip of tambour and had no idea that I was completely overlooking something right here. Can you guess what it is? Don't feel bad if you don't because I had no idea until later. I added a round over to the top of the monitorizer and realized that I had this little divot that needed filled. Now I knew it wasn't deep enough to have the polymer stick in there, so I chiseled it out a little deeper before filling it with that same not filling polymer. Right away, I hated this. It looked like a big black stain on top, but I'll come back later and address that here in a bit. I'm almost ready to assemble the tambour cabinet, but before I do, I need to square up the ends on these curved parts. Now, this technique of gluing some sandpaper to a flat surface like this piece of plywood is really effective, and just after a couple minutes, I had both of these flattened. After gluing on the sides, I can add the back panel, but these ends weren't sitting perfectly 90 degrees to the top, so I scribed the backer board and cut this on the table saw at that slight angle. It's probably like 88 or 89 degrees, but after sneaking up on the cut, the back panel fit nicely and I could glue this all up. All right, so I've got the top all mocked up. This isn't actually glued on yet. And I've got the, the tambour down in the groove. And I realized that I kind of overlooked something. So right here on this edge where I wanted the pool to catch, that way it couldn't go past. What I forgot to account for is you can still see a little gap in there. So what I decided I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this extra piece and cut off the ends that ride in the groove, and then I'll glue that here, and that'll give me a little bit of a spacer to kind of go past that opening and kind of close that gap. You know, you won't be able to see into it at that point. This bothers me because now that first strip isn't continuous grain, but when the cabinet is closed, it'll be hidden, and when the cabinet is open, the rest of the door is hidden, so it's just a little detail that only exists to drive me crazy. You've already seen the hole in the top of the tambour cabinet, but here I'm gonna show you where I was cutting that out with the CNC, and this is for a cable management pass through. The ledge you saw me cut supports the cap and I'm making that out of Purple Heart. And as you'll see here in a bit, this fit perfectly and is totally a testament to my slightly above average 3D modeling skills. 
I need to drill a couple two inch holes through the slab and I recently bought this new set of Fortune bits. This isn't some magic revelation or anything, but having a brand new super sharp bit for cutting through the slab was awesome. I mean, it cut like butter and I had almost zero tear out. The set wasn't cheap, but it's really nice. And I'll drop an Amazon affiliate link for it down below if you wanna pick one up for yourself. Before I glue on the tambour cabinet, I wanna get the finish applied to the bottom and reinstall the C-channel. I'm going with Rubio Monaco, which has become my go-to finish. It's super easy to apply and surprisingly durable. And the best part, it looks great on walnut. All right, back to the tambour door. It needs finish on it before I can install it since there's gonna be no way to add finish to the whole thing once it's installed. And next up, that center shelf gets glued on and these long reach hand screw clamps worked really well for clamping that down. Okay, back to that black blob on top of the tambour cabinet and Jeff came up with a great idea. He told me I should cover this up with a bow tie inlay. And even though that bow tie is sort of out of place right here, just being used as a patch, it's gonna look much better than that black blob. Before I glue on the cabinet monitor riser, I finish the inside with more Rubio as this is also gonna be really hard to access once I have it installed. So I have to use epoxy to install this anywhere where the wood touches the epoxy on the tabletop. And to prevent that from staining the walnut, I'm adding some tape to the edge. Once the cabinet is in position, I added tape around the perimeter, which does a couple of things. One, it gives me the exact location of where to glue the top, and two, it prevents any glue or epoxy squeeze out from staining the top. I'm using some Total Boat 4-Minute Quick Curing Epoxy and brushing that onto the end where I've marked it contacts the epoxy on the tabletop. I did have to get a little creative about this glue up as I don't have any clamps wide enough to apply even clamping pressure to the whole cabinet. So to fix this, I had some two by fours and I cut these to be the same height as the tambour cabinet. And then I can rest these other two by fours across and then clamping on each side gives me equal pressure to secure the tambour cabinet to the tabletop. As I finish the rest of the table, I want to talk about the table base. And for this piece, I wanted a really nice sit-stand desk. So Vizibo is sponsoring this video and they sent out this Vizibo Ultra 3-stage standing desk frame, which was really easy to assemble. I needed a new desk for the office of my new shop and this super sturdy Vizibo base was perfect for this project. And if you're thinking about building your own desk for your home office setup, I really encourage you to check out the link to Vizibo's website listed down below. This base can resize to fit a wide range of desk sizes. And I was amazed at how high this thing lifts. With the range this thing has, if you're shorter or tall or anywhere in between, this would fit your needs. They even have full desk kits you can buy if you don't want to build your own top. And they sit out this mid-century modern standing desk for Jeff to try out. And this thing looks really, really nice. Make sure you check out that link below as Vizibo has many different models and sizes that are sure to fit your needs. Last up, I'm adding the Blacktail N3 Nano Finish, and this stuff is the next evolution of furniture finishes. The Rubio has had a full seven days to cure at this point, and I could add the N3. And what this does is add a nano layer of protection and hardness that not only makes the top extremely durable, but also enhances the sheen and appearance. My pieces aren't really finished now unless I've added N3 Nano Finish, and it's been a game changer for the pieces that I build. So if you're building or refinishing furniture, I highly recommend you check out N3 and find out for yourself. I've got a link for it down below. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I built this desk for me, but honestly, it turned out way too nice to be my everyday desk in my dusty, dirty shop. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw it up on my website for sale in the hopes that one of y'all can put it to good use and not probably destroy it like I will. All right, man, uh, you had that uh, stack of like kind of hidden forgotten slabs on the back of your property. Yes. This is what we turned it into, man. What do you think? Uh, yeah. I didn't know that wood was that pretty or I never would have given it to you. <laughs> <laughs> How many more of these slabs do you have? I got a half dozen maybe of these. 
I'm so glad that I found that slab buried in the stack at Vintage Reclaimed Lumber. And if you're in the area, and if you hurry up, you may still be able to grab one for yourself. And I think they'll even ship them out to you. I've got a whole playlist of similar projects for you queued up right here. Make sure you comment this if you watch to the end and make sure you get subscribed so you don't miss my next build.